recording. Okay, hello to everybody who's joining us and welcome or welcome back to MRI Climate Talks. My name is Eri Saikawa and I'm an Associate Professor of Environmental Sciences at Emory University. There is a lot going on in the world right now. I am extremely saddened by Justice Ginsburg's left. I am also extremely disappointed with the grand jury's decision for Breonna Taylor case. Yesterday was the first presidential debate and I have never seen anything quite like it where it was not really a debate. I'm so excited that we are able to gather together today to discuss the movie that I think is extremely important for what we are going through right now. As usual, I hope that Emory Climate Talks event can provide a space where we can all be open and honest about the problems we face and discuss how we can best move forward to transform our society. Emory Climate Talks is made possible by our anonymous donor that supports our trip to the United Nations climate change negotiations and Emory Climate Talks is in partnership with the Department of Environmental Sciences and the Resilience and Sustainability Collaboratory at Emory University. Before I introduce our amazing speakers today, I wanted to talk about some logistics and thank all the listeners for your support. As usual, this talk is being recorded and we have muted you all. Please use the chat function to address any questions you have to the speakers at any point. We will take them uh, at the end uh, after each speaker uh, finishes speaking. All the past talks are also on the YouTube channel and you can subscribe at youtube.com slash C slash Emory Climate Talks. I would like to thank Leah Thomas for doing all the work behind the scenes. This event would not have been possible without Patagonia and the film production team. So thank you all so much uh, for um, making this possible. Um, for the Emory Climate Talks, please subscribe to our newsletter as well um, so that you will receive all the upcoming talk information directly to your mailbox. Um, please visit our website climatetalks.emorydomains.org to find more about the upcoming talk information. So today I'm so excited that we are gathering to talk about the new Patagonia movie, Public Trust. And we have three amazing speakers uh, to go with that movie. First, I would like to introduce Hayden Davis, who is a senior in the college and a member of the steering committee of the Emory Votes Initiative. Um, the Emory Votes Initiative fosters a more engaged campus um, by providing nonpartisan voter information, supporting voter turnout, and empowering our community with credible resources. So Hayden, uh, so great to have you and the floor is yours. Thank you so much and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, so. Perfect. Um, so to me, I think if there's one takeaway really from the film, it's just how central our elected officials are to everything going on. Uh, you can see the direct impact the president, administration, and members of Congress have to either protect or undermine our natural environment. And so there's really no question that the future of our public lands rests firmly in the hands of elected officials. And that means that it also rests in our hands. So this election is going to be our chance to have our say. And I can't stress enough how important the outcome is going to be. Uh, ultimately, we have the power to get the government we want, especially here in Georgia, where not only is every member of Congress up for election, but where we're also voting for not one, but two senators. And it's going to be really close. Uh, every vote is going to count. So we need everyone in the Emory community and out of it uh, to be taking the steps necessary to make our voices heard and votes counted. So for those of you who aren't registered to vote yet, um, if you're a student from out of state, you actually have two. Your first question is where to register. You can register in your home state, or if you're currently in Georgia, you can register here instead. Uh, the voter registration deadlines in all states are coming up, so it's important if you aren't already registered, you have to do it now. Um, if you don't know if you're registered yet, you can check your registration online. Just go to emory.turbovote.org. Uh, they also send really helpful updates to help with the process, so I definitely recommend signing up to TurboVote Turbo Vote either way. Uh, here in Georgia, the voter registration deadline is October 5th, so literally five days away. So if you want to register here, um, I'd recommend uh, re registering not actually directly through TurboVote, uh, but by going online to the Secretary of State's website uh, and printing out a voter registration form. Then you can fill that out. They're pretty straightforward, but if you do have any issues, you can go to our website 
at campuslife.emory.edu forward slash vote. And I'll include the links in the chat at the end. Uh, but uh, if you fill that out and then mail it in, you don't need a stamp, you don't need to put an address on, you can take it to the Emory Mail Center, or drop it in any box and, and it'll get delivered. Um, and then you can register that way. If you have a Georgia ID, the process is gonna be even easier. You can do it all online through TurboVote, so no need to print out or mail anything at all. Um, and I should add that if you've already registered in Georgia, but are out of state right now because of COVID, uh, that's absolutely fine. Your registration is still valid. Uh, just make sure to request your absentee ballot so you can actually vote. So that brings me on to the next step, which is uh, once you're registered, making a plan to vote. And the biggest decision right now is whether to vote absentee or in person. That's really your choice depending on where, whether you're away from where you're registered right now, how concerned you are about long lines, getting to a polling location, the risk of COVID, et cetera. So if you choose to vote absentee, make sure you request your absentee as soon as possible. That's the key thing. If you're already registered, request your absentee ballot today if you haven't already. You can do this through TurboVote or the Secretary of State's website directly. Then, as soon as you receive your absentee ballot in the mail, fill it out and send it. The Postal Service is going to be under an unprecedented amount of strain this year. And by mailing your ballot early, you can help ensure it arrives on time and also relieve some of the stress on, on the Postal Service so they can handle all the other ballots they're going to be receiving closer to Election Day. And so it's really important to send your ballot back as soon as possible. For students currently on campus, make sure to check your mail regularly as well, as the mail center doesn't notify you when you get letters. So you won't get a notice from Emory that your ballots arrived. Um, now, if you requested an absentee ballot, you can still change your mind and vote in person instead. Just make sure to bring your uncompleted absentee ballot with you when you vote. Uh, if you didn't receive your absentee ballot, you can still vote in person too. You'll just have to fill out an affidavit confirming you didn't also vote by mail. Uh, now that brings me on to voting in person. Uh, the key to voting in person this election really is to vote early. Uh, don't wait until today. Early voting starts on October 12th and runs through October 30th. Uh, early voting is great because it allows you to vote without the long lines that we've all seen in it here in Georgia and also minimizes the risk of spreading COVID and helps keep lines shorter on election day, which means just everyone gets better access to the polls. Obviously, you can vote on election day, uh, but voting early is easier and safer, especially this year. So it's definitely what we'd recommend. Uh, do also bear in mind that your early vote location might be different from your election day polling location. So make sure you know where to go ahead of time if you're going to vote in person. Uh, and then just carve out some time in your day, any time from October 12th onwards, and go ahead and vote. It's, it's going to be that simple. And then the final step, really, is just to make sure that everyone else you know has their plan to vote too. As the movie showed very clearly, the stakes really could not be higher. The impacts of this election are gonna span far beyond the next four years. And it's only by exercising our right to vote that we can ensure government is making good decisions for everyone. Uh, if you have any questions or issues, feel free to email us at emoryvotes at emory.edu. We're happy to answer any questions and help however we can. Um, and like I said, I'll definitely put these links in the chat. Thank you so much for having me once again. Thank you so much, Hayden, for um, explaining about this and for doing what you do. Um, this is so important and I'm so um, proud of what you're doing. Um, so if anybody has questions, um, please um, use the email address. And I would like to now move on to um, ask Professor Mindy Goldstein, the clinical professor of law and the director of the Toronto Environmental Law Clinic and the Director of the Environmental and Natural Resources Law Program at Emory Law School to introduce our second speaker, Alice Rolls, the CEO and founder of Georgia Organics. Mindy, please take it away. Thanks, Ari, and great to see everyone virtually. I'm incredibly excited about uh, discussing this important film. As Ari mentioned, I'm a professor at Emory Law School where I direct the Environmental Law Program and the Turner Environmental Law Clinic. The Turner Clinic is a public interest environmental law firm housed in the law school and staffed primarily by law students. Each year we provide over 4,000 hours of free legal representation to communities and organizations seeking to protect and restore the environment and fight for environmental justice. Our representations cover a wide range of issues from energy to agriculture to resource protection. 
and we have spent many years fighting to protect our public lands. Currently, we're engaged in a multi-year collaboration with the Natural Resources Defense Council to force the Department of Interior to make public its reasons and justifications for rolling back public land protection. As you saw from the film, some information has come out, but there's still a lot of secrecy and much work to be done. When we're not working to protect public lands, we're working to protect small and mid-sized farms. And we're representing organizations across the country to build an environmentally beneficial and resilient food system. While our work has taken us to Washington, D.C. a lot, and to cities and counties from coast to coast, much of this work began here in Atlanta. The clinic had the incredible opportunity to represent Georgia Organics in its efforts to increase food access through urban agriculture and farmers markets in our city. Under Alice Rolls' leadership, we worked with the city of Atlanta to adopt one of the most permissive and comprehensive urban agriculture ordinances in the country. I'm thrilled that gardens can now grow anywhere in our city and that Atlanta's ordinance has served as a model for over 50 cities in the United States. It's my honor and privilege to introduce Alice to you today. She has devoted her entire professional career to the environment and natural world, working for 36 years in the nonprofit arena, lending her expertise to the development of three organizations. Alice is currently the president and CEO of Georgia Organics, a nonprofit organization working to connect organic food from Georgia farms to Georgia families. Prior to this position, Alice was executive director of Earthshare of Georgia. She also worked for six years establishing and developing the Nature Conservancy's Georgia chapter. Alice was, received a degree in biology from the University of Virginia, where she was also a division one athlete on UVA's field hockey team. She later traded her hockey stick for a disc and competed nationally for over a decade with the Atlanta women's ultimate Frisbee team. She currently serves on boards of the Atlanta Bicycle Coalition, Foodwell Alliance, and Ag Leaders, and is a member of La Dame de Scoffier. One of her greatest achievements in life was biking across the country in 2002 without getting a flat tire. When not working, Alice can be found tending her edible garden, transporting herself by bike around town, or foraging for mushrooms in undisclosed locations. Alice, I'm so excited that you can join us today, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mindy. I see you read my extended bio. And to embarrass me, um, but I appreciate it. I'm thrilled to be here tonight with all of you. And what a beautiful, hard film, but a beautiful film um, that we got to see in public lands. Um, there was a, a poignant uh, statement made during that film that said, we owe our livelihood to six inches of topsoil and occasional rain. Um, what wasn't mentioned in there was, uh, we also owe our livelihood to farmers. And, um, and so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the work that we're doing at Georgia Organics and it's important to the conversation about land use um, as well as climate change and, and the importance of regenerative ag. Um, I know many of you that are on this call tonight or this seminar are not from Georgia, um, but agriculture is our number one industry here in the state. And you may not know that if you're not from here um, but we're big vegetable producers. We've got lots of chicken being produced here. Vidalia onions and blueberries are some of our top crops in addition to cotton, pecans, and peanuts. Um, I don't generally work with the big commodity crops, um, but we're increasingly trying to get into that space. Um, in Georgia, the ag industry is a $73 billion industry. It covers 10 million acres of private land. So we have a tremendous ability to influence climate change with the decisions that are being made by individuals and families and companies on those lands. Um, our mission at Georgia Organics uh, uh, is to try and increase the amount of regenerative and organic agriculture in this state um, across the country. That number is still 1% uh, of agriculture in our country. And when we look at climate change and the impact that Georgia can have, agriculture is going to have to be one of our important solutions. Um, our soils um, can sequester carbon. Um, a lot of the carbon in our atmosphere came from our soils originally. And so the importance of that six inches of topsoil and rebuilding soil health and rebuilding organic matter um, so that we can sequester carbon will be absolutely critical in the future. Um, we are all about really shifting agriculture from a, a commodity mindset, which is typically what you read about, 
um, to a more community mindset. And um, I see our farmers as really ecosystem managers. They are, you know, we want an agriculture that's regenerative, not extractive. And we want an agriculture that's going to make us healthy and not sick. And I think we've tended to put agriculture over here in, in a silo, no pun intended, um, when we really need the public health people engaged, we need other sectors, ecology, wildlife management, making those decisions together. So it's a, it's a holistic system. So you can't just look at one farm and you can't take the consumers out of this either. You can't take the research um, and other institutional um, purchasers like our school systems. Here in Georgia, we have we serve 1 million meals uh, a day to kids during the school year. Uh, and we need to look at ways that we can influence um, those purchases, both for the kids' health, but also for the health of our land. Um, so we, some of the practices that we are proponents of with regenerative agriculture are everything from low, no to low-till um, agriculture, planting cover crops, rotating diverse crops, eliminating or reducing uh, pesticide use, um, which I want to remind you fertilizers and pesticides are all petroleum-based products. Um, and then adding animals to management grazing, compost, and, and other things like um, preserving riparian buffers. Those are all practices that we want to see emulated. Um, the, the organic local or good food movement, whatever you call, has been led by small farms. It's been led by the five acre farms and the 20 acre farms. So when you look at organic agriculture in our state, most of that is happening at the, that level. Our real challenge is to try and get bigger farms converting. And so by doing that, we've got to work with them, understand what their challenges are. Um, we need to work with researchers. We need to work with commodity crops. Because if we can get one 5,000 acre farm transitioning to regenerative practices, that can make a big impact. And that's where we need to continue to focus our efforts. Um, something I've been very proud about in the last three years that we've been working on is we have the first co-op of organic peanut producers. And we have thousands and thousands of acres in, in peanut production. Um, and we're just trying to get to our first thousand acres, which hopefully in the next couple of years we will. But we have 10 farmers now that have formed the basis of a co-op um, for organic peanuts. And it's not just about peanuts because they've got to rotate those crops with soybeans or cotton or some other. So we have to work with them and we have to get our institutions at UGA and Fort Valley, our extension agents engaged in that, in that process. So I'm excited about that. And if we can get good models happening on those farms, it's gonna be the peer-to-peer -peer exchange that will happen. With a, when a farmer sees a farmer down the street doing something and having success and, and potentially getting um, organic uh, values, which, which could be you know, five times more the commodity rate, then we'll be really cooking with gas and, and hopefully see um, acreage increase in, in the state. Um, in addition, there are opportunities. It's, it's all kind of a quandary right now um, for carbon credits. Farmers have been left out of sort of the whole carbon credit um, uh, movement. And there's a lot of efforts right now. And there was a, a, a bipartisan effort um, that uh, created a, a, a ver verifying agent, the Growing Climate Solutions Act that was a bipartisan effort um, approved in June um, to begin looking at. We don't have good man measurement tools yet for measuring carbon sequestration and carbon in the soil. Um, hopefully that will improve with time and we can actually create those kinds of incentives for farmers to move towards those production practices. In addition to working with farmers and helping them with their business um, and their production, we're also working at the community level, whether it's farm to school efforts, whether it's improving food access, local policy that Mindy, um, it, it really does, it's a systems approach and we've got to do everything we can um, to lift the farmers. And I, I just want to leave you um, in just my short remarks here um, is that all of you have the potential. This is the beautiful thing about working in the good food movement is you eat, maybe, 
breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. And so your ability to say what kind of agriculture you want to support um, is something you should really think about um, to, to influence that change. Because the good food movement has been driven by the consumers. And um, I think it's a real bright spot. There's a huge opportunity um, to do a lot of good work in the next decade. And I'm excited to be part of that. And I'll, I'll close there because I'm sure I'm probably at my five minutes and happy to answer some questions later on. Uh, thank you so much, Mindy and Alice. Um, next, um, I would like to introduce the host of this event, uh, our Associate Vice President of Resilience, Sustainability and Economic Inclusion Efforts, Kina Howitt, who has been leading Emory Sustainability. Uh, so please welcome our Georgia super lawyer, Kina Howitt, uh, who will introduce our main speaker of the day, Abby Bravo from Patagonia. Thanks so much, Ari, and thanks everyone for being part of this exciting evening. And a special thanks, of course, to Patagonia for creating the beautiful movie Public Trust and letting us have um, the benefit of being joined tonight by Avi Garbo. Avi is a nationally recognized environmental leader, lawyer, and advocate with decades of experience tackling the most critical threats to our air, water, and lands. Honored by the National Law Journal as the Energy and Environmental Trailblazer, Avi currently serves as Patagonia's environmental advocate, helping to sharpen and strengthen the company's voice and vision on environmental and conservation issues as Patagonia pursues its mission being in business to save the home planet. Nominated by President Obama and confirmed with the unanimous consent of the Senate, Avi served as general counsel at EPA from 2013 to 2017, the longest to hold that position. And prior to that, served as the agency's deputy general counsel. Avi's service as EPA general counsel occurred during the most advanced efforts of the federal government to address climate change. And Avi played important roles in developing, implementing, and defending key domestic and international climate change strategies. Avi also helped lead the environmental practice of a major international law firm and was a distinguished federal prosecutor in the US Department of Justice. Avi received the Robert F. Kennedy Award for Public Service from the University of Virginia School of Law, obtained a master's degree in marine affairs, and, is, and serves on the Board of Trustees for RARE, an international conservation organization, and on the board of the Organic Trade Association. Thank you so much, Avi, for being with us tonight. Thanks, uh, Kina. The only, the only thing about the intro you left out is that um, for, what, 30 years now, I've considered you my environmental mentor, so I'm grateful oh. for your work um, for the invitation to join you all at Emory for the work at the Sustainability Center there um, to the Turner Environmental Law Clinic and certainly uh, Alice it was a, a pleasure to hear you talk I know we've got uh, at Patagonia great admiration for your work and for that of Georgia Organics um, I think those as you said who are uh, in the ag space and certainly work on organic issues really understand the transformative power of agriculture and specifically organic agriculture. And we talk a lot at Patagonia about the solution, um, certainly a big part of it uh, being in the soil um, and organic farming. And as I'll talk a little bit later, uh, regenerative organic farming is really an untapped gem when it comes to solving our climate crisis and, and making our communities a lot more resilient. Um, and finally, just by way of some intro thanks, um, thanks to Hayden for uh, those great remarks. Um, this is uh, in so many ways um, an extraordinary time that we're all living in. Uh, I genuinely hope that folks are safe in their own homes and communities and, and get, getting through the pandemic um, okay. Uh, but we're faced with uh, a, an election of enormous consequences when it comes to the issues certainly that I care about, that Patagonia cares about, and I know everybody here is invested in. And, and the, um, the instructions and guidance that Hayden provided uh, about voting um, is, is really important. So five days ago, Patagonia released our film, Public Trust. 
Um, for those that have seen it, um, you know, and for those that haven't seen it, I commend uh, it to you. It's about um, our system of public lands, um, all 640 million acres of them and the fight to protect them. And, and more importantly, I think what I want folks to take from the film and certainly from our talk tonight is it's really about each of our responsibilities individually to care for these lands and to protect what has been entrusted to us uh, and therefore entrusted to our children and our children's children. And we need to start thinking of the subject matter of public trust and, uh, and public lands in general as our lands. Um, and when we do it though, we must always remember that our lands, our public lands were once uh, native lands and we need to understand um, and respect that. Now, these public lands are an American legacy. They're something that I think, unlike many issues that we deal with politically and otherwise, um, uh, are, present some kind of unifying uh, in, in, uh, commonalities for us. They're sacred places. They are wild places. They are a source of wonder and beauty. And in spite of all of that, they are under attack. And so the movie Public Trust really focuses on three particular national treasures, Bears Ears National Monument in Utah, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness in Minnesota, and the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. And it focuses, of course, on those who are on the front lines fighting to protect them. Among others, the Intertribal Coalition working to protect bear's ears and the 100,000 or more archeological and cultural sites there. Focuses on the Gwich'in people uh, working to protect their own homeland in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and the porcupine caribou herds that have sustained them for thousands of years. It is a, a place I was struck in the movie uh, that they refer to as their Serengeti, so special. And those in Minnesota, and throughout the country fighting to protect the boundary waters and its thousands of lakes and streams. But the movie is also, I think, about politics. It's about the fossil fuel and the mining companies who are out to destroy them. But we need to understand that the fight for our public lands um, is neither distant, um, nor is it new. Um, and it's not as well confined to the three areas that are the subject of public trust. The first national park, Yellowstone, was established in 1872 by President Grant. It was actually the first national park in the world. And after Yellowstone was established, a local paper called it a great blow to prosperity. A couple years later, Grand Teton National Park is established and their opponents feared that Jackson, Wyoming would soon become a ghost town. Jackson, Wyoming, and Teton County is now the wealthiest county in the state of Wyoming. In the 1880s, when uh, bills were floated to establish uh, and set aside in a national park in the Grand Canyon, an editorial in the local Arizona paper there said that the idea of a national park at the Grand Canyon was a fiendish and diabolical scheme, and that anybody who came up with that idea must have been, quote, suckled by a sow and raised by an idiot. And we see what has become of those glorious and special places. But the threats that we have today to our national parks are real. The harms that imperil them are unlike uh, the kind of the opponents of the past in terms of the scale uh, of, of harm that, that can befall them. Um, and we need to understand that it actually elevates in many ways um, our responsibilities to safeguard and preserve these places. Already, our public lands are being used to exacerbate our climate crisis. The fossil fuel industry and others um, are using the public lands to emit about a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions in this country. Nearly 40 percent of all of the coal extracted in the United States, the dirtiest among the fossil fuels, comes from our nation's public lands. And our government, the Department of Interior in particular, and its sub-agencies who manage these lands for you and for me, is no longer just selling them off to the highest bidder. 
the Interior Department frequently sells public lands to the oil and gas industry for less than the cost of a cup of coffee per acre. In 2018, nearly a quarter million acres were sold for the minimum bid of $2. Our lands have become, as somebody said in the film, A Public Trust, the greatest cash cow left on the planet. And while these lands may feel distant in some regards, they're not. They're bound up in who we are and where we live, and they belong to all of us. In Georgia, for example, you all have uh, nearly 2 million acres of public lands, almost 5% of the state. The Okefenokee Swamp in the southern part of Georgia is the lar nation's largest wildlife refuge east of the Mississippi and one of the world's largest intact freshwater ecosystems. Closer to home, I think, to folks in Atlanta and to Emory, over 3 million people last year visited the Chattahoochee National Recreation Area last year. And just to give you a sense, um, at a much larger scale, uh, last year at our national parks alone, they had over 330 million visitors. That eclipsed the number of people that went to every game in the Major League Baseball, NBA, NFL, NASCAR, and every Disney amusement park combined. So you get a sense of how beloved and how important national parks and national lands are to, uh, to all of us. So I want to kind of emphasize that the fight to protect our national lands cannot be left just to those in public trust who are fighting to um, get back the protections for the Bears Ears National Monument. We're fighting to preserve the Boundary Waters Canoe Area uh, from the Twin Metals Mining Company. We're fighting um, it, as the Gwich'in people are doing to make sure that the calving areas for the porcupine uh, caribou are protected uh, and not soured by the drilling. This is not a western eastern divide. This is not an urban rural divide. This is not and for sure should not be a Republican and Democrat divide. Democrat divide. This must be an issue that we all take up collectively as Americans. If there's ever an opportunity to find common ground, um, this is it. And we need to band together uh, and, and, and unite and kind of stand tall. And, and, and uh, you know, this is really for me, I think what public trust is about. But Alice talked you know, at the beginning about uh, lands more generally. And so I wanna shift a little bit from our public lands to another issue that's um, quite frankly important to, to me, it's important to you in Georgia, uh, and it's critical, I think, to Patagonia and how we see things when it comes to the environment. We talked about 640 million acres of public lands. There are 650 million acres of land, nearly a third of all lands in the lower 48 that's used for pasture and rangeland. In addition to that, there are nearly 400 million acres used in this country for cropland. So taken together, nearly half of our lands in the contiguous US is used for agricultural purposes. And how we manage these lands, how we grow our food, how we treat the animals raised on them, how we nourish our bodies and our communities is one of the important, most important issues of our time. Um, and it's clear that the folks at Georgia Organics know it, uh, the people that they work with know it, and it's important that all of us begin to understand the importance of uh, our, our lands and our agricultural sector. And how we use these lands, importantly, to fight our climate crisis, both to decrease and mitigate the emissions of greenhouse gases, but also to make our communities more resilient in the face of a changing climate. This has to be on the public policy agenda in every state legislature and in the nation's capital. And we have a responsibility to ensure that our elected officials pay attention to this. Currently, the agricultural sector accounts for 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the US. Nearly 80% of all emissions of nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas that has a global warming potential, 300 times that of carbon dioxide. That's emitted from the ag sector. And while the ag climate problem is well known, so is the ag climate solution. 
organic farms emit about 18% less global warming potential than other farming systems. Organic farms sequester more CO2 in the soils than non-organic farms. And by making our soils more healthy and rich, organic farms are less susceptible to the droughts that are scorching our, our country, and they're better able to hold water in the face of extreme weather events. Now I wanna shift a little bit and talk about a new certification, the regenerative organic certification that Patagonia supports. Regenerative organic certification builds on the USDA's organic standards and really, I think in many ways, is setting a new bar for what's possible in food and farming systems by adding some additional criteria for soil health, for animal welfare and soil, uh, excuse me, social fairness. It's about the soil, it's about the food that grows in it, the animals that walk on it, and the people in communities who work it. Um, and we need to approach these issues um, particularly when it comes to organic and regenerative organic with a sense of urgency. Think about where we are in 2020. We've got about 30 harvests left before 2050, when scientists have told us that we really need in this world to live in a net zero carbon world, 30 years to go. In terms of our topsoil, some of the scientists for the UN have said it takes up to a thousand years, certainly many, many hundreds of years, just to generate three centimeters of topsoil. And the United Nations has estimated that we may have only between 50 and 60 harvests left before we have so degraded our topsoil that it can no longer support our food production. So we're in a crisis mode. We're in a climate crisis mode. We're in a food crisis mode. We're in a land management and protection crisis mode. But fortunately, this is a crisis with a solution. Again, one in the ag space that can regenerate our soils, heal a broken agricultural system, and unlock the true capacity of food production to help solve our climate crisis. So I want to at least encourage folks that are on here um, who have not yet checked out Georgia uh, Organics to do so. Um, would invite you as well to uh, check out Patagonia's uh, food business, Patagonia Provisions, where you can actually see a, a new and growing marketplace for regenerative organic certified uh, food and products. But more importantly, I want to encourage you to become active when it comes to issues of public lands as set out in public trust and issues of food security and, um, and agriculture. And on that kind of uh, idea of activity, I want to close at least before we open it up to some conversation to give you a couple of my own thoughts on, on the upcoming election and what it's at stake. And, and while I don't think that folks need um, extra motivation, what I'm encouraging folks to think about is themselves uh, as partisans in this election, not necessarily for politics, but for the planet. We need to embrace the notion that this is our fight and our time. And we need to understand that there are folks who will fight to protect our public lands, the public lands um, reference for sure in public trust, um, but also the Okefenokee and the Chattahoochee um, in areas near where I live in Virginia or wherever you are, um, state lands, city parks, um, national wilderness areas, there are people who will fight for those lands and we need to understand that when it comes to November 3rd. There are those who are gonna work through a food system that's not dominated by the moneyed interest in the producers of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers or monocrops, or large confined animal feeding operations, but instead are gonna to work to invest in farmers and ranchers who invest in their, um, in their soils, in their communities, and contribute to the health of our future. There are people who will fight, importantly, for social justice issues, for environmental justice issues. And so um, certainly, I, I think we need to approach this election um, 
is one where we're mindful of who are the environmental and climate champions that we need to support. Now at Patagonia, uh, we've got a mission statement and our mission is quite simple. We're in business to save the home planet. And so I want to invite everybody here to, to adopt that mission. It does not need to be the only motivating factor, but I would um, uh, impress upon you the need to become engaged on these issues because they involve every one of you. Now, Aldo Leopold, who I think many of you probably know is one of our nation's foremost ecologists, in commenting on conservation said that conservation is a positive exercise of skill and insight, not merely a negative exercise of abstinence and caution. And for me, um, that is a call to action. It's the notion that to be an environmentalist, to be a conservationist, to care about the protection of public lands, to care about our stewardship of our agricultural lands is not a passive activity. It's one that requires vigilance and action by all. And so for me, um, if there can be any takeaway from uh, public trust and certainly from the things that we've discussed a little bit this evening, it's the notion that we need to take our motivation out from our homes, certainly uh, uh, exercise your right to vote, but more importantly, continue to be active uh, in educating yourself and your neighbors on these important issues. Um, and I think we'll look to kind of a positive future where we can really all share uh, in, in the kind of environmental solutions that I think are reflected in, in, in both our public spaces uh, and regenerative organic ag. So I wanna stop here um, mainly because I think there's, there's a lot to engage in with uh, Alice and others, but um, looking forward, Keenet and others, just to fielding some comments and questions uh, from folks in the audience. Well, Avi, thank you so much for those remarks. And we received our first question just as we were beginning to come on to our event. And that was from Gordon Kenna, who asked um, whether you thought the next Supreme Court nominee would be asked about public lands protection. And, and I guess even more specific, anything about her past decisions related to this area that we should watch out for? <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, the short answer is I, I don't know um, what uh, Judge you know, Amy uh, Coney Barrett's past decisions on public plans have been in the Seventh Circuit, um, but let me say a couple points on that. Um, you know, and let's look, for example, on the issues uh, addressed in, in public trust. Uh, it, they, the legal questions, I think, for our public lands really um, arise in different contexts. When we talk about Bears Ears and National Monuments, we're talking about the legal interpretations of the Antiquities Act and the legality for a president to, in effect, um, undermine the authority exercised lawfully by a president, in this case, President Obama, uh, to create a national monument to protect our cultural and archeological treasures. Um, and so that's an issue that's, uh, that has really never been decided um, in the courts before. Uh, it's a novel issue. Um, and so I think, uh, depending on the outcome, certainly of this election, um, it'll be a question as to whether or not it indeed makes it up to the Supreme Court. But other issues like the uh, issues uh, dealing with oil and gas leasing and, and the uh, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge are certainly issues a little bit more um, uh, attuned to the courts. Um, these issues not just come from uh, the tax provisions that have um, you know, Congress passed to allow uh, some of the leasing to occur, but more importantly for uh, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, and administrative law questions and whether or not the records uh, from the Department of Interior really adequately look at issues like climate change, like impacts on imperiled species um, when it comes to the issuance of those leases. So I, I, I think um, these are the kinds of issues that could get to our highest court. Keep in mind that um, the last justice that was confirmed, Justice Kavanaugh, came from the DC Circuit, um, where most of these sorts of cases and administrative law and public lands uh, type cases 
um, were heard. Uh, and, and um, you know, these will be the first times in many instances that, that a Justice Kavanaugh as well uh, will hear them should they make them up to the Supreme Court. So I guess the final thing, just in response to the, the question about um, the role of the courts is to state what I hope is obvious to most folks, um, which is courts and certainly the Supreme Court um, only get cases um, uh, when the kind of controversies uh, arise through the judicial system, but there are opportunities in the executive and legislative branches to address these issues in advance. And so the outcome of this election on issues, again, that are environmentally important, that are uh, related to our public lands, um, you know, it's extremely consequential. We kind of know and have seen in the last three and a half years um, what a Trump administration's position has been. Uh, you can read certainly on uh, Joe Biden's website uh, what his campaign is talking about. And I think it's fair to say uh, that the outcomes when it comes to protection of public lands, when it comes to um, kind of the affirmus, affirmance of the science of climate change and our opportunities to address it, um, really lie on, on the voters' decisions in November, um, some of which can uh, really take out of the court system uh, some of the issues that are impacted by public trust um, and some of the other things we've discussed. Thanks, and I invite everyone to put your questions in the chat, and we do have a good number of those questions coming in. The next one is, how do you feel about last night's debate and Vice President Biden denouncing the Green New Deal? Do you see that as a setback or just Biden trying not to alienate himself from moderates? Well, so um, uh, I, I feel like I could quote Dana Bash uh, talking about last night's debate, but I don't want to get um, too profane on this call. Um, it, it was, uh, uh, shall we politely say, an extraordinary hour and a half. Um, one that I hope none of us have to uh, um, suffer through as Americans again. But when it comes to the Green New Deal, um, look, uh, Joe Biden's plan, and I'm not you know, speaking on behalf of the campaign, and this is certainly not meant to be uh, an endorsement on this call, but Joe Biden's plan is out there. It's a $1.7 trillion climate uh, plan that's quite comprehensive. Um, and, and as, as uh, the Vice President said, um, you know, that's his plan. I don't think that he necessarily denounced, if you will, the Green New Deal, um, but, but the Vice President has offered a, a climate uh, plan that looks to uh, achieve net zero emissions from our electricity center, uh, sector by 2035, you know, net zero economy-wide by uh, 2050, talk about building efficiency upgrades, talk about changing our, um, you know, kind of electrifying our transportation sector, uh, addressing the regulatory opportunities for our power plants and our um, largest emitters, um, getting us back into the Paris Agreement. So I'm not so kind of hung up on uh, whether uh, the vice president, should he be elected, is out of the gates going to adopt what people have referred to as the Green New Deal. For me, um, the outcome of, of the debate on that topic was the, was the vice president basically signaling that he has got an extraordinarily robust and comprehensive climate plan. And I think he is, as I would, would urge folks to compare that with the alternative in the Trump administration. Thanks. Um, the next question is, if the administration changes adopting a stance that is supportive of public lands, what would you suggest as the most important issue to tackle first? Um, it's a, it's a, a great but a, a very difficult question. And, and I think there are a, a number of things that need to be addressed and can be addressed, by the way, almost simultaneously. I mean, one, when it comes to Bears Ears and when it comes to uh, what I think was the um, unlawful uh, taking away or shrinking of our national monuments, I think uh, a new administration can address that um, you know, through a proclamation, restoring, in a sense, the full boundaries of the Bears Ears National Monument and Grand Staircase Escalante and really uh, looking to give full measure to those uh, protections under the Antiquities Act. Um, I think a new president can um, uh, restore kind of our faith in climate science and make sure that when it comes to our National Environmental Protection Act, when we are looking at federal actions that have environmental impacts that we consider 
climate impacts. It's kind of uh, preposterous in some ways not to do so. And I think that's something uh, a new president could do. Um, you know, uh, I, I think there are a variety of things that a president can do in terms of establishing, you know, directing the Department of Interior to look at opportunities to uh, establish additional wilderness areas to talk about the Bureau of Land Management and reshape it and, and refocus its mission on protecting uh, and, and, you know, the, the use uh, of our public lands and not really selling them off to the highest or even the lowest bidders in the oil and gas industry. Um, and not making uh, our public lands the source of our climate problem, but making them where appropriate part of the solution and finding those sites for um, renewable energy operations on public lands that can uh, more cheaply and cleanly power our communities. So there are a lot of things that a new administration can and I hope will do when it comes to our public lands. Thanks. Our next question comes from one of our Emory students. As someone who has fought for the environment in countless different, different arenas, what advice can you give to Emory students who want to pursue careers in environmental advocacy? What are some of the achievements you've been able to be a part of and witness in the arena of public land issues? So um, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, it's a question, Kina, you could answer um, as well as I could, um, but also you know, so many folks uh, on, I think, this call could have their own answers. Um, uh, look, when it comes to environmental issues, I have always, uh, you know, seen these as um, as opportunities to serve the public. And and when it comes to public lands in particular, these are these are places of great inspiration that belong to us all. And, and you can serve uh, the public. A long and storied history of supporting grassroots organizations like Georgia Organics, by the way, um, because we understand. Um, can you all hear me? I can't tell if I'm frozen or not. Yeah, can you hear me? You're, you're fine. Yeah, you froze for a minute. Okay. Um, yeah, well, we have an issue. I don't know if you have this when um, somebody uses our microwave in the house, the Zoom goes down periodically. So my, my apologies. Um, in any event, um, uh, look, there are grassroots organizations that make an incredible difference. And, and you know, folks at Patagonia have long known that the people who are closest to the problems and bring the most passion uh, to the solutions um, you know, really can make the greatest impacts in many ways. And so there, there are any number of opportunities, I think, kind of in, lo in local endeavors uh, to, uh, to make a difference for folks. Um, and then, then there are opportunities as consumers, uh, as investors, and as employees of businesses. Um, you know, I'm extraordinarily proud to be part of a business like Patagonia that's got as its mission um, saving the home planet. Um, but there are opportunities, again, wherever you land, to bring your full self uh, and your investment in our future and our environment to bear, uh, whether it's the private sector or the public sector at a local you know, or a, a national level. Well, you really hit on what was the next question, which is, do you think tackling these issues from the business side, like through Patagonia or a public policy side, is more effective? But I think you just answer that with your last answer. So I'm gonna move on to the next question, which is what's the story behind the creation of public trust? I'm curious why this story was told through a documentary film versus a short film, YouTube videos or other media. So um, the film, you know, I think as folks know was uh, executive produced by Robert Redford and Yvonne Chouinard. I think it's the first time the two of them had, had this opportunity to work together. And, and Patagonia has long been for example, invested in these particular fights. I mean, we sued the Trump administration on uh, the Bears Ears decision several years ago. That case is pending. We have long been an advocate for the Gwich'in people in their fight in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And we have long been associated with the folks who are uh, fighting to keep, again, the lakes and streams and the boundary waters uh, clean 
in Minnesota. And, and, and um, you know, why, why this was made into a documentary versus um, some of the smaller films, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think there are some issues um, as important as this that need to uh, be explored in greater depth. I mean, keep in mind, you know, we're talking about um, just, you know, three places out of hundreds, if not thousands of sites um, you know, it, throughout every state in our country that are, that are our public lands. And as the, the story tells, you know, each one of them is susceptible to kind of external threats. These happen to be, um, you know, big threats from primarily uh, the fossil fuel and, and the mining companies. Um, but there are other threats on local levels. And I, and I think really to do a film like this justice, um, it was important to uh, to do it in the full length, uh, you know, kind of feature format. The other thing that I didn't talk about, but I, I think it's it's really important to to mention, um, uh, was the 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 Montana ranchers that were featured in the film. You know, these are these are folks um, who are again stewards of the land, who understand um, uh, how to responsibly. Um, use public lands uh, and and I think you know we need to understand that that their them and their ways of life um, and their communities are also threatened by these kind of special interests and fossil fuel interests that are addressed there so you know the film public trust is not just about places it's about people uh, and and you know and, and it's also as I said in my earlier remarks not just about the people who are featured in the film, but it's about every one of us because these are our public lands. The next question is addressed to both you and Alice. It says, thank you both for talking about the importance of organic farming. How can we better promote this idea other than in the community of farmers? In regard to driving consumer demand for foods with organic or regenerative certifications, are these products economically feasible and affordable for the majority of U.S. citizens under current conditions, or does there need to be a serious do there need to be serious policy reforms to support their growth and success? So I'll let Alice go first, and I'll follow uh, on her comments. Um, that was a, a big question. Um, well, I think um, the, 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 the cost of organic is a, a tricky one because um, what you're paying more with regenerative agriculture um, labels or organic agriculture labels is really more the true cost of food. And our food system, current food system has suppressed the cost of food. So it's a challenge. Um, in addressing because we want people to have access to good food. So I think our, our public health policy needs to align and support that. I think we also need to become educated on how we can manage and eat food, um, eat good food and eat organic food affordably, which um, also has a lot to do with getting back into the kitchen. Um, we have to remember that organic farmers are bearing the burden of proof. So that is a voluntary program that they sign up for. It's like one of the only regulatory programs what, that somebody volunteers okay. to pay more money to get that certification. So the burden of proof is on the organic farmers. Um, there's little transparency in our agricultural system. And this younger generation, and many of you on this call, um, transparency oh is really goodness. important. So I think we need policy um, that gets at that transparency, that levels the playing field um, of cost and the burden and um, everything that goes with that. Um, in speaking about just equity, you know, we've done a lot of work uh, to try and promote black farmers, um, BIPOC farmers. We're on our own journey as an organization um, to become an anti-racist organization. I, I'm obviously white and I've been leading the organization and there are many things that we have not done. So we're, we're reckoning with that right now, but we've done some good work. And even at our conference this past year, we had a black farmer prosperity track. Um, so uh, we're doing a lot of work. A lot of our COVID support that's been going out the door right now is for BIPOC farmers. 
Um, and so we've been building a very uh, rich and diverse movement. And you see that in the good food movement, the local food movement, the organic food movement, way more. If you go to any other agricultural conference, it is a lot of old white, a lot of old white guys. So, um, so it's building this community of people that um, I think is is key. And then we've got to provide some support for for uh, limited resource individuals to have the access to subsidize that, subsidize some of that food through programs like Wholesome Wave that doubles food stamp dollars at farmers markets. There's a lot of innovation happening there. Um, so I'm encouraging this community cares about those kinds of things. Um, so, but we definitely need the policy on top of that. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just add a couple things to what Alice said uh, and try not to uh, be duplicative. I mean, in short, I think there are policy reforms that are important. Um, and for example, if you, uh, just on the kind of climate agricultural space, the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, as many folks know, put out a lengthy report over the summer um, that it has hundreds of recommendations you know, across industrial sectors about how to address our climate crisis. And more recently, uh, the Senate Democrats have a, a, um, a special committee on the climate. They put out a Senate report um, that similarly has hundreds of recommendations. And each of those reports devotes a chapter to um, agricultural solutions and policies that can, again, lift up climate smart agriculture, um, uh, better support organic and regenerative organic practices. Some of those uh, policies include um, you know, additional technical assistance. M most of the USDA's um, kind of conservation related programs are oversubscribed and underfunded. Uh, and so farmers who want to transition to organic uh, have difficulty accessing those funds and those programs. So we need additional help there. Crop insurance uh, issues really have an impact on the ability of farmers to transition um, uh, and profit from it. Uh, and, and then finally, I guess, you know, the one thing, and Alice, I think, mentioned this uh, earlier, we need to start recognizing and rewarding farmers and ranchers for the ecological and climate related benefits that they're providing to us. Um, and, and there are ideas out there when it comes to um, uh, providing added carbon credit like incentives um, you know, or other programs. And I think we'll start to see uh, some of those gain some traction in the coming years. And I will add that Emory's own Professor Saikawa, who is hosting this event, is an expert in that area of sequestration of greenhouse gases and soils. So we know there'll be good things to come. The next question, Avi, is although many environmental advocacy organizations have encouraged the transition from industrial chemical to regenerative organic in hopes of making the farming industry sustainable, how can we increase equity outputs in the industry? So we talked a lot about that and the fact that currently whites make over 95% of farmer producers and the USDA continually faces issues of racial discrimination. So while making the industry sustainable is important, how can we make it equitable? Do you have anything more you, either of you wanted to add on that or is that pretty well covered? Um, I, I guess the only thing that I'd say um, is, uh, maybe it doesn't need to be said, we, we need to focus on issues of uh, environmental justice and equity. And certainly when it comes to um, you know, food health and, and food security, I think we're dealing with um, great inequities um, in our cities and elsewhere. Um, and organics, I think, can play a big part of that. Um, bringing them in, uh, I don't know, again, what the situation is in Georgia, but um, you know, some states uh, really um, have some you know, fundamental barriers to bringing uh, organic food and healthier foods into the school systems and making them more available uh, to students you know, um, at all income levels. Uh, and we need to kind of address that. I was just on a call earlier um, with actually a, a farmer uh, from Georgia, African-American farmer representing um, some, uh, some black farmer co-ops down there uh, and their issues uh, dealing with the kind of transfer of lands, um, you know, given some AIR, uh, H-E-I-R laws uh, and how that kind of impacts their ability to kind of access uh, funding. So 
Um, I'm not by any stretch an expert in that, but I'm glad somebody raised the issue. It's something that's um, important and needs to be addressed. Yeah, the only thing I would add there is just we need to support, um, which I assume that group was the Federation of Southern Cooperatives and other um, uh, Black-led organizations. We need to help them get resources and help lift them. Um, and there have been many groups that have been around for, for decades, um, historical groups. So uh, that's another thing that we can be doing is supporting those groups. Thank you. In the debate last night, Joe Biden mentions that he wants America to go 100% clean energy by 2035. First of all, do you think this is possible? If yes, what would the transition look like for the energy industry and the economy in general? If not, what would be a realistic time frame for America to go 100% clean energy? Um, so the, the, the short answer is um, yes, I think it is possible. Um, uh, you know, I would and certainly invite others. I will do the same to go back to some of the more detailed plans that are laid out there. But, but we have um, for quite a long time, I think, um, uh, fought against politically um, the transition that needs to happen. We have unduly subsidized fossil fuels um, and not uh, subsidized or invested enough in renewable energy sources. We need to actually revamp um, our, our research and development out of the Department of Energy uh, to continue to innovate in this space. So I, I, I you know, I, I don't have specifics, Kina, to offer, um, but, but I think there are um, various pathways in which we can uh, look to uh, decarbonize our electricity sector, certainly by 25. We're already seeing, I, I think, in various states where the uh, dollars or cents per kilowatt hour for renewable energies are now cheaper in many instances than those by fossil fuels. And, and the, you know, the increased affordability of these technologies is gonna make them more, um, you know, more available. Uh, and I think you know, you'll see more of them on the grid. Great. The next question, if the federal response to the environment remains as passive and detrimental as it has under this administration, what power do state and local governments have to pick up the slack in reducing emissions and protecting vulnerable land? And how effective do you think that they can be? Uh, well, first, let me um, just say we, we don't need to settle for um, the response that we're currently getting at the federal level. That's, um, that's what elections are for. And so I'm extremely hopeful that Americans will um, when it comes to environmental protection and climate issues and public lands issues, um, uh, you vote their conscience and vote for the environment uh, on November 3rd. Um, but, but, you know, if this last three to four years has taught me personally anything, it's that we can no longer, if we ever could have, uh, rely solely on the federal government to um, ensure the kind of environmental progress or climate response that's needed to improve our lives. We need to look uh, at government at all levels. And I think people uh, fail to remember that states are in many ways um, the innovators when it comes to uh, environmental protection programs and other things. Um, I don't know a lot about uh, what's going on in Georgia, but you know, New York is doing great things in the climate front, as is California, of course. Uh, northeastern states have, have long been out in front in terms of uh, carbon reduction uh, opportunities there. So I think that there is a lot that, that the states can do. Um, you know, I, I remember uh, a couple years ago, um, the Climate Mayors Organization formed, and there were mayors in every state, um, red and blue, uh, representing um, large majorities, I think, of the population of the United States, talking about opportunities in their cities and, and municipalities to actually make progress when it comes to uh, more energy efficient building codes, when it comes to uh, opportunities for public transportation um, or you know, electric vehicle um, uh, kind of subsidies. Things like that at the state level can make an enormous difference. And then finally, let's not forget the power of the private sector. You know, when we look to um, other than the federal government who sets regulations and, and kind of is the floor of the emissions, 
you know, many of us have the opportunity in our own homes and our own businesses to um, lower and address our carbon footprints, to uh, deal with you know, our own environmental baggage in our backyards and in our front yards. And so the capacity of businesses, of, of institutions of higher learning like yours, Keynote, to be leaders um, in, in these fields of sustainability and actually um, provide replicable models that can be carried out, not just in other academic institutions, but in, in other organizations, big and small, that's really what gives me hope. And so irrespective of what happens in the upcoming election, my hope is that we still see um, a, a lot of activity in the private sector. Can you talk a bit more about your experience working in the Obama administration as EPA's general counsel? What was the biggest obstacle hindering the government's response to climate change that you experienced during your time at the EPA? Well, um, so there, there, there are many obstacles to addressing climate change, um, both then and now. Um, but, but um, you know, we, I, I, look, in 2013, President Obama goes to Georgetown University, right, August, sweltering heat. And he delivers a, an incredibly impassioned speech to the students there. And he talks about climate change, um, you know, and not uh, in this generation, certainly the generation some uh, probably represented here being the first one to feel the effects of climate change and the last with the opportunity really to address it. And he came out with a climate action plan and charged EPA among other agencies with moving forward with whatever statutory authorities we had to best address the problem. And so in my time at EPA, uh, I was fortunate both to um, participate a little bit in the negotiations between the United States and China, which helped lead to the Paris Accords, uh, but, um, but also importantly, on the Kigali Amendment, um, which uh, our administrator you know, represented the nation in signing, dealing with HFCs, also um, a potent climate issue, uh, and then the, the Clean Power Plan. So, you know, there were authorities and opportunities out there um, to address carbon emissions and to address them, I think, in very, very meaningful ways. Now, it turns out that, the, that um, you know, with the result of the last election, the current administration, of course, has um, not only hit the brakes, but put us in reverse on a number of these things. Um, and I, my hope is that if there is a new administration uh, after November, certainly after January, that um, there will be opportunities to re-engage on many of these uh, climate-related uh, pushes. But the one area that I think um, where, where, you know, where we need some help uh, is, the, is legislatively. And, and that, you know, we had difficulty in the Obama administration to get anything uh, passed out of both houses of Congress when it came to um, kind of a proactive or a comprehensive climate legislation. And my hope is that, um, you know, as, as more and more people in the Senate and in the House understand the science of climate change, which has been well established, by the way, for decades, uh, and understand the need to support communities from coast to coast who are all feeling the, you know, the, the immediate and harmful impacts of climate change, that maybe, just maybe, we can get some action out of this Congress and see some movement in that front. Great. Next question. What are some ways environmental advocacy can be expanded so that people from different backgrounds, income, political, race, can all be involved? So um, there, there are, are a lot of ways, and I, I honestly, I think it, it needs to start young. Um, somebody made reference to me earlier to um, uh, a, a group actually in Atlanta. I don't know if it's called the, the Greening Youth Foundation or something like that, uh, but an organization that, that actually goes into, you know, whether it's urban areas or, or kind of underrepresented areas, it, it, and takes kids out and, and gets them in, you know, in, a, in a climate conservation or an earth conservation core type environment, gets them out of their comfort zone and into the environment where they can, um, they can learn, they can, they can learn to love. And you can't be an advocate for something until you've been exposed to it and exposed to it in a way um, where it, I think, resonates with you and, and where it's something that you 
develop a passion about. And so starting early, uh, I think, is extraordinarily important. And any, any program that can, again, reach kids uh, at the elementary school and high school levels and expose them to opportunities you know, to make a difference in wild spaces and public spaces. Um, and, and I think that's where you're going to spark um, you know, kind of creativity. But, but th there are um, many, many uh, organizations that, that are, I, I think, you know, being run by and focused on the BIPOC community when it comes to environmental issues. Um, one of our former employees at Patagonia has um, raised awareness about intersectional environmentalism and making sure that we understand uh, the connections between people and place on, and elevate, again, the passion amongst all peoples for environmental issues. So uh, I actually am uh, incredibly optimistic about that. Um, you know, the, the coalition is broad. We need to think about it that way. But we really need to nurture these passions and interests from an early age. Avi, a repeated conservative take on using fossil fuels on public land is that this cheap source of natural resources and energy makes economic sense for the public good. When working with those who work under the capitalistic framework of economic profit as foremost, what arguments can we use to persuade them that sustainable energy and protecting public lands are in the true best interest of the nation's people? So there's nothing cheap about fossil fuels. And we need to understand that, that um, there are no built-in external, you know, the externalities, if you will, of fossil fuels are not built into the cost. Um, and you, know, you think about the number of multi-billion dollar um, natural catastrophes that this country has, um, you know, kind of suffered just in the past year from hurricanes in the Gulf Coast and up the southeastern you know, seaboard to the, the wildfires raging in California and Oregon and Washington and, and in our western mountains, to the droughts that, uh, that folks have suffered in the southwest, to the flooding that inundated the Iowa farms just a year or so ago. I mean, these are the costs of fossil fuels and carbon emissions. And so the notion that you know, a $2.50 you know, gallon of gas it has it built into it um, the cost that the American taxpayers are paying on a daily basis for carbon emissions um, is simply uh, false. If we actually, um, you know, stop the subsidies and built in uh, all of the external costs that we're already paying, the comparison between renewable energy uh, and, and uh, sources of fossil fuels um, would be uh, uh, you know, it would be stark to folks. So I think my response, Keena, just to the question is, we need to understand um, uh, that the costs uh, are great. But the other thing too is, um, you know, climate change is a global problem. Uh, and, and we are seeing uh, impoverished people uh, around the globe being impacted by these, uh, these uh, environmental catastrophes. Um, and so, you know, our, our emissions here in the United States are contributing in large part to uh, climate migrations and, and uh, kind of climate induced um, you know, uh, food issues and issues of poverty around the globe. And we have a solution in front of us. This is not, this is not a problem without a, a solution, right? It's not, um, you know, it's not either we uh, burn fossil fuels or the lights go out. Um, we, we actually have clean sources of energy that work, whose prices are going down, who employ, by the way, far more Americans in high paying jobs um, than all of the fossil fuel companies combined. This is a way of seizing economic opportunities and kind of growing our economy at the same time addressing um, you know, our climate needs. So you know, we need to start looking this as not just a problem, but as an opportunity and solutions in front of us. Okay, thank you. We see a lot of backlash towards more progressive climate change plans right now. For example, people saying that the Green New Deal would be akin to socialism and impossible to carry out. Would you say that there was a similar attitude toward the creation of public lands? And is there something to learn from the similarities in how we promote these plans? So uh, 
it, it's a it's a really um, interesting question, and and I guess I I, I don't know enough candidly about um, all of the creation of our public lands to make that comparison. Um, you know, but but I think we need to ask ourselves who are behind um, you know what who and what is behind the most vocal opposition to a lot of the provisions that have been uh, put forth in, in you know, Green New Deal type plans. I mean, you know, these are the, the special interests in many cases, the oil and gas industry or the fossil fuels um, who feel as though they've got you know, the most to lose and are trying to hold on to a business model um, you know, that is uh, central to their profitability, but also central to killing the, uh, the climate of this, of this country uh, in, in this world. So I, I, I uh, I'm skeptical uh, about the folks who are themselves skeptical about the viability of things in the Green New Deal. Um, you know, there, there's a, a lot of work that can be done to put forth any number of the programs to kind of lift up, um, you know, environmental justice and overburdened communities. Uh, and and um, so the, the, I, I guess I don't subscribe to the narrative that, that nothing is doable. Um, I see great potential and possibility not necessarily in the entirety of the Green New Deal and certainly um, in, in whether it is immediately applicable, but I think it's appropriate to actually be a little bit aspirational when it comes to environmental protection and issues like this. It's the only thing we have. Patagonia does an exceptional job at storytelling, the average person, and very much in their own words, meeting them where they are in a sense. What sort of guidance can you offer us to help start these conversations in our communities about the climate crisis with folks who might be less inclined to care, let alone act? How can we better connect on a local level where it's relevant to them? Do you have any advice for how to communicate to others the urgency and individual responsibility needed for advocating for public land? What helps to keep you motivated in the midst of political gridlock? So I, I think um, uh, communication is key, and I, and I uh, agree that Patagonia and you know we've got a tremendously talented team of filmmakers and uh, at, at folks who do know how to storytell. It's one of the hallmarks of, of Patagonia. It's one of the things I think that that um, makes us an important voice when it comes to environmental and conservation issues because of our ability. Uh, to present these sorts of, of stories to uh, people around the country. But I think, you know, in many ways you have to, um, perhaps as the questioner um, has indicated, meet folks where they are a little bit. Um, for example, this is, this is a, you know, uh, I was in a meeting about uh, carbon tax one time. And the premise of the meeting, it was a kind of an invite only and, you know, in a room with a lot of, uh, people on both sides of the political aisle and a lot of people uh, in the fossil fuel industry represented. And the premise, of course, was that, you know, should the carbon tax or various pricing schemes be um, used to address climate change? And one of the speakers came in and talked about how um, he presents the issue to folks on Capitol Hill, uh, on, uh, at least many on one side of the political aisle. And when he talks about carbon tax or carbon pricing, he never mentions the words climate change. For him, um, it is an issue relating to you know, the best way of, um, of increasing revenue in, uh, for the Treasury Department. It's a, it's a, you know, a revenue creation model. And, and uh, when it came to kind of uh, the vagaries of the tax code, uh, this is how it's presented. Um, and, and ultimately for that individual, it said it didn't matter whether it was pitched as a climate change issue or not what we're trying to do is get a price or a tax on carbon emissions, on pollution. Now, I'm not, not sure I would go that far. I mean, for me, disassociating a carbon tax with, uh, with climate change may be a bridge too far. Um, and I do think that it's important to kind of have a level set um, discussion about climate change. I, I'm not one who can simply uh, put under the, uh, under the rug the idea that the science shows that you know, humans are contributing to climate change and instead just talk about, well, how can we solve these weather problems? Um, you know, th this, this is not just a weather issue, this is a, a change in climate. But that being said, when I was at EPA, for example, we were very um, careful to talk about uh, climate as a public health issue. You know, I mean, climate change exacerbates um, uh, uh, asthma 
attacks. And so for people, you know, that have, uh, you know, issues with asthma and they've got children who want to go to the playgrounds, that's an issue of importance for them. In the outdoor industry, for example, you know, we, we um, like to get people outdoors. We like to get them in the mountains in the winter, um, you know, skiing or running in the summer, enjoying the outdoors. That's becoming more difficult for people uh, with the extreme weathers. It's an economic issue. Uh, and so, you know, whether you're talking about the economic risks, the public health crises associated with it, or importantly, as I said before, um, the economic opportunities, the keys to innovation that can be unlocked by seizing climate leadership. These are the sorts of things I think that can resonate with different people. We've come sadly to the end of our time. I know we could talk all night about these issues. Ari, I know, wants to close things out, but let me just say thank you to all of our speakers. I really appreciate you doing this for us at Emory, for our community. Um, and with that, Ari, if you have any last thank yous. I just, um, I didn't mean to um, come over, um, Kina, you could have finished it, but I just want to thank you all. Uh, this was such a great discussion and I really appreciate uh, everybody's questions and what great com uh, comments and answers that you all provided. So thank you so much. This was one of the most well attended event. Uh, so that was great. And I hope you all stay healthy and safe. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, folks. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much.